Hi, and welcome to this week's podcast episode of Web3 Compass. In this episode, I'm going to interview Oliver Chantin. He's the founder of Basenote.io, which is an invoicing and accounting software for digital assets. I heard him speak last year at the Crypto Assets Conference, and I thought his project or his startup really has utility, and I want to have him on my show. And these are my top three key insights from the interview. So first of all, freelancers in development countries are paying ridiculous amounts for payment transactions. For example, if they receive their salary, they sometimes pay like a double digit percentage amount just for transaction fees. And as we know, the blockchain can replace intermediaries and there are good use cases, for example, to use stable coins for payment. And this is the second insight. For example, if you're living in a country with a high inflation, it might be very interesting to receive USDC, for example, as a payment option. And lastly, we also talked about cryptocurrencies in general, we, and we philosophized about what is money and what will happen after the 21 million bitcoins are mined. I first heard him speak at the Crypto Assets Conference last year and I thought his startup has an interesting business model, which is why I'm very happy to welcome to this podcast episode Oliver Shantin from Basenote.io. Um, welcome to my podcast. Hey, yeah, thanks for having me. And um, yeah, let's, let's have a nice, insightful conversation, right? <laughs> Shall we start uh, right with a quick introduction? Um, yeah, sure. So my name is Oliver. I'm CEO and co-founder of the crypto startup Basenote.io. Um, I'm the second time uh, second time founder, so um, I don't I don't have a classical IT background like most founders or like business background. I'm actually an engineer. So um, yeah, my field that I studied was industrial engineering. I studied this here in Germany in Hamburg. And um, after finishing my master's, I just um, yeah got into the startup world, uh, and also I fell into the Bitcoin rabbit hole. So yeah, this is um, yeah <laughs> quite unique combination maybe. But uh, yeah, and then a few years later, I moved to Berlin, where I'm currently also living, where also my company is uh, located here. And um, yeah. It's a short it's introduction. A very interesting background, and I think you also did a lot of with uh, a lot of stuff with three uh, D printing, right? Right. Yeah. So after I finished my studies, I was working at the university, uh, university uh, in Hamburg, and there they had a blockchain research center, um, mm -hmm. and they still have the blockchain research center there, and they were developing smart uh, smart city devices and uh, little swarm robots that were floating through the um, through the water in the city, for example, or through the, the canals. Mm -hmm. And they were measuring all kinds of stuff. And my job was to design and uh, prototype. So with a pre with a 3D printer to to design and build the small um, cases for the for the robots that were collecting data. And like, uh, yeah, that, that was my job it was uh, actually pretty cool because you could be very creative, uh, right? So especially when you're in research, um i mean on one hand these institutions like universities they're often quite bureaucratic so that's uh, what i didn't like so much about it but on the other hand you have um, a lot of freedom when it comes to um what you want to build what you want to uh, focus your research on and um, yeah this was uh, this was my first job after after my studies that sounds really interesting and also smart cities i think this will be a big topic in the future also from a cybersecurity perspective, because currently I work at Cloudflare. I got some mm -hmm. touch points with, for example, um, cybersecurity for um, yeah, for the public sector, for cities and smart cities, of course, when you have a lot of, for example, I IoT devices also or different uh, points in the city. Um, very, very interesting. And of course, um, another thing which is very interesting is that you were nearly three years the chief operating officer of Digaru. Uh, can you mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more about this? Yeah, so um, as I said, I had this job at the university. I was uh, 3D printing the little cases for the smart city devices, but it was only 20 hours per week. Uh, yeah, so most, uh, most of the times if you start a university job as a researcher, if you're lucky, you get a full-time position, but most of the time you get like uh, yeah, 20 hour job uh, per week. And so I had some time left. I went to some co-working spaces in the city and um, that's also where I met my first co-founder. 
um, and we founded this e-learning startup called uh, called Digaroo, mm -hmm. where I was uh, the chief operating officer. And well, the aim was to bring blockchain knowledge to banks and insurance companies, uh, because back then it was 2018, 2019. So um, blockchain wasn't really popular among institutional investors uh, like banks. So. Mm -hmm. and stuff like that so we built this e-learning platform and um, it was quite okay but it never really took off and i also learned that the e-learning market is really hard to handle i mean there's so much competition like free you can get so much free education on youtube uh, right if you're willing to watch a few commercials you can learn basically anything for free mm -hmm. and uh, it's really hard to make some money there um yeah that's also why we um yeah more or less abandoned the project after a couple of years and then i started my next company <laughs> yeah that's that's true and when you built this um, e-learning platform about blockchain education um, when was the first time when you got first in touch with crypto or web3 oh yeah good uh, good question so web3 back then wasn't even like a, a buzzword like it is today um, the the scene was was very very much different so My first contact point with uh, with Bitcoin and with the blockchain technology was quite early in 2012, I think. But uh, of course, back then I didn't understand it. Like most people, right? when you first hear about it, you're like, "Oh yeah, this is a scam. This is a Ponzi. I'm not like not going to invest any more time in in learning about it." And then a couple of years later, 2016, I like got a touch point again with with bitcoin and i was like oh yeah okay the price is a lot higher than four years ago when i first heard about it so maybe if it didn't die until now there's something to it so i started learning about it and yeah that's when you when you invest like one or two hours learning about uh, blockchain and bitcoin then you basically either you fall into the rabbit hole uh, for a very long time or um yeah sometimes the idea doesn't click with with people but for me it definitely clicked And um, yeah, yeah, this is this is how I first learned about it. And then I was sure I had to work in this space um, and do something really meaningful and, and try to make this technology, the blockchain technology more accessible and more usable, because I always feel like it's so it's so powerful. There's so much potential, but people can't really use it because the user interface of most um, of most blockchain apps is just not really good. Like my mom couldn't use it, my grandma couldn't use it. So it's it's not um, it's it's like sending an email in 1997. It's not fun. <laughs> yeah, that's right? true. It's it's also very impractical and I think oftentimes also dangerous. But I think, mm -hmm. for example, MetaMask with their now PayPal integration, at least in the US, and also startups uh, like your startup, um, it's moving in the right direction. And it also becomes more practical and I think also more connected to reality and not only connected to theoretical concepts. Right, right. And maybe also um, I ask founders oftentimes, what was your or what is your biggest lesson um, from your time at Digaru? Oh, okay. Mm, well, one thing that I had to learn as a founder is... Um, you need to do sales no matter what <laughs> you need to be good at selling your product and you need to start um, marketing and outreach not you you don't start it when your product is done and you're like okay now i can maybe sell it to people no you start way before that right so in the in the minute that you start prototyping the mvp that you have the idea you know what problem you're going to solve start the outreach like build a landing page collect some emails and um, basically every time you talk to someone about your idea or your product it's a test and it's also a test for your ability to sell stuff right so if you're if you're forming a good narrative a good story around your product and um, you're you can train yourself every time someone asks hey what are you doing what is your product about you can train yourself and be get better and better at um at basically telling your story and convincing people that uh, this is like what you're building is actually necessary and, and, and helping people. So, yeah, um, you know, I, I was one of those founders who was actually, so I'm more like an introvert, usually not very loud person, um, but you have to, you have to be a little bit more outgoing and, and start reaching out to people first, which was very uncomfortable for me in the beginning, you know, cold emailing and stuff like that. But um, it's just part of your job when you're a founder. 
I can uh, totally identify myself with it because during my time at university, I also wanted to start a company and it was not successful. And then now, uh, so I graduated last year in, in April or um, at the beginning of last year. Then I started in like a junior sales role at Cloudflare because I said I want to have this skill. Maybe if I will be like a founder in the future, I will be probably not the CTO will be probably not the technical part, but I could be like the sales and marketing, uh, the downstream part. It's also amazing what I learned in my time right now. I'm now responsible to create leads for uh, more experienced sellers, so for account managers or account executives. And for example, there are so many different approaches. And for example, some people are doing a lot of cold calls And um, I was now the last two quarters in probably the ton, uh, top 10% in the EMEA region. And I completely mm -hmm. switched my approach. And now I, I just basically just do cold emails. And this is uh, what works very well for me. And I think there are so many types or so many ways how you can sell. But you have to find your way. You have to be also comfortable with it because some people are very comfortable on the phone. I also have not a problem cold calling somebody, but I think oftentimes the people don't want to be cold called and I'm mm -hmm. also not a fan of cold calling people. But when I just send somebody like an email and maybe also give some valuable information to the person, this is more like my approach to get them into another meeting and to learn more about, for example, Cloudflare. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, an email is always like a little bit more polite because you're like, oh, yeah, you pick the time when you like want to read this. But a call is like, I need your time right now. Right. So yeah, it's it's more. Yeah, it's more direct. Um, That's true. It's, it's Yeah. I mean, I also like as a founder, my so my phone number is on my website from my startup. So I get a lot of uh, cold calls, too. And I'm always trying to be very friendly. Um when I'm like <laughs> denying the offers that I'm getting. But um, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's quite a lot. I, I mean, I mean it's, it's probably very effective to cold call people too. Yeah, better Sometimes. than emails probably. Mm. I think it's, it depends on the industry, but it's also can be very frustrating. So a lot of people are very rude. And I think also in the German market, say it has not a good standing. But yeah, I, I like uh, that you that you talked about it. And um, I also want to ask you, talking about entrepreneurship, was there like a specific point where you knew that you wanted to start a company because it seems like you had this clear path as an entrepreneur? Yeah, it was not a clear path at all. <laughs> so I... Um, so after I finished my studies, I got this job at the university and um, this is like... Um, Yeah, in German, you call it Öffentlicher Dienst. So it's a very secure job and you're basically paid by, by the government, right? Um, because the university is a state university. And um, that means um, you like it's very hard to lose your job, but it's also very hard to be really successful. So um, if you want more money, you need to spend more years in this uh, institution. And um, it's not a, it's not so much about what you do. It's more like, oh, yeah, I'm here for like 20 years, so I deserve mm -hmm. more money. So it's not, they're, they're not measuring, they're not measuring the output. They're measuring like the input. How many hours do you put in versus what's your result? So I didn't really like that mindset. And it always was like um, in, in the back of my head, I was like, okay, something maybe this is not the right environment for me because I think I can do better if I get the right incentive structure around me. So, and I, I felt like it wasn't the case in, in the university. And um, I mean, it was a nice time, but I knew that if I was in a, in an environment where um, you, where your output is measured and you're rewarded based on how much you do and how what you achieve, um, and not in how much time you spend uh, achieving it, then um, it's probably better for me. So that's why I um, I left the university. I actually quit my job there before I even knew what I wanted to do next. <laughs> so my mom hated me for that, uh, basically uh, calling me crazy because this is like the best you can do in Germany. You have like a safe position and so on. And I was like, no, it's not like I do. I, I want to do something else. I'm not really sure what yet, but... Um, 
so this was not a clear path for me at all to come to entrepreneurship. And then at some point I realized, okay, I, I'm good at like managing people and I'm not so good in taking orders from others. So that's like a predetermined path a little bit. And, um, yeah, then I just, um, started. Um, so the first thing I tried was, uh, just registering a business, which in Germany cost around 20 to 30 euros and you can do it online. So it's really quick. And then I started, um, like looking for clients because I was like, okay, I'm fresh out of university. What can I even do? Right. A lot of theoretical knowledge, but not really a lot of, of like experience. So I started offering uh, consulting jobs for companies. Mm -hmm. It was just, hey, here, I'm your project manager. Just hire me. I will like manage people. I will do um, like analysis of X, Y, Z or find out why a process is not running smoothly and so on. So I put that out there and um, actually got um, my first clients. Mm -hmm. um, like um, it was a print magazine company in Hamburg and I was working for them. I was just like um, solving problems in the company and learning and um yeah, so it is possible to just put yourself out there and, and start small and then learn how, how everything works. Right. So, mm. And then you started at the print company and it was successful from the start and you, you had, I say, not too much experience about the media industry, but you were successful in optimizing their processes. Yeah, so... Of course, in the beginning, you don't make a lot of money, right? Um, but um, you have to play your advantage. And my advantage was I'm um, very good at like um, analyzing stuff and, and finding solutions. And I'm cheaper than a regular consulting agency. So these were yeah. my two selling points, basically. And uh, this is what you need to leverage then uh, to be successful. And this is what I did. Um, I didn't like in the beginning, I, I earned like... 20 euros per hour or something, mm -hmm. which is ridiculous for a consulting job, right? But I knew that I wasn't very experienced and um, 20 euros is better than zero. Uh, so um, I was, yeah, I was quite successful with, with that work, but it didn't really scale. So then mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I have to build something where I don't have to mix my own labor with my product in order to make money, right? So um, that's why we started uh, the Digaroo, the first startup, which was very scalable because it was an e-learning platform so you produce content once and you can sell it a million times right so uh, we didn't sell it a million times but uh that's that's the idea and um yeah then you then you learn more and more like scaling is not everything um if you just um pick a business model because it scales well that's also not the right way to do it because uh first of all you need to be sure that you have a market fit and that you're actually solving a problem for someone who is also willing to pay money to solve this problem. This is like the biggest hurdle. And if you figure out that, then you can think about scaling, right? So, and this is also a lesson that I learned. Um, yeah, you get better and better at it over time. Yeah, but I can also totally identify with uh, what you said, because for example, Nassim Taleb in his book, Black Swan, he also talks about look for a job that scales. And he, I think, became like a quantitative trader because he has had to be uh, really good in what he does. And then he could handle, for example, bigger and bigger amounts of money and take mm -hmm. a share from it. For example, um, maybe not on the same level, but I also did like a six month investment banking internship. And I also thought it's a very tailor tailor made uh, work. So you do these pitch decks, you have also some project management in it. You have these, um, yeah, all the stuff. But after the project is done, you have to do it again. And I think there could mm. be um, in this age also other processes. But the way a lot of the investment banks work, and also the clients or the investors want it, is like the traditional approach. And I think selling, even though it, you also have to put in like working hours, I think it scales because we have some top sellers and they are so good in what they are doing that they can achieve a lot with, let's say, um, a fair amount of work input because they have a skill which scales. Mm -hmm. And yeah, interesting. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, also talking about uh, entrepreneurship and maybe your, your current project. Um, in, 20, uh, in April 2021, you were one of the first, I, I think it's called Venture Leads of the Blockchain Founders, Cro uh, Founders Group. Mm. And I was yeah. wondering what exactly does, uh, does this mean? So after I decided that uh, Digaroo, so this e-learning platform was not really um, yeah, taking off, it wasn't really flying. Um, then I talked to my to one of my co-founders and he was living in an entrepreneur flat here in Berlin. And he said, well, Oliver, you should come to live in our flat and um, you should also like look for other opportunities like incubator programs or something where you can participate. And he was um, participating at Entrepreneur First at this time. And um, I was like, okay, should I really like move because I lived in Hamburg for 10 years at this at this point. So quite a long time. And I was like, okay, move to Berlin. Um, most people have a very bad image of Berlin. Um, me too at this time. I was like, ah, should I really move to this to this city? Um, but um, yeah, so in, in this entrepreneur flat, people were um, using um, psychometrics to like determine who could live there, which I never heard of before, but it's, it's quite interesting. So um, maybe you've heard of uh, MBTI types and stuff like that. So they were like, um, yeah, testing people and they were like, okay, you're a good fit for our flat. You were not a good fit, fit and so on. And they were like, oh, Oliver, you're like the perfect fit. We are missing this type uh, among the other types that live here and so on. And I was like, okay, let's try it out. And then I went there um, for like a weekend to like get to know the people. And uh, we actually clicked very well. So in this case, uh, this whole psychology, psychometric thing uh, really worked out and uh, I was really clicking well with the other people. And then I decided, okay, let's do it. Let's get out of my comfort zone and just, um, yeah, move to, to a different city. Um, and that's also when I got into Blockchain Founders Group because I came across their incubation program and they were looking for people who are willing to build blockchain startups. I had mm -hmm. already a little bit of experience in building startups. I had experience in the field of blockchain because of my research work that I was doing before. And um, that's why they, they, yeah, they gave me a chance. And it was actually pretty cool. So in the beginning, you're what, you're what is called a venture developer. Mm -hmm. So you work on different ideas. So they, they basically have a pool of ideas. Let's say they have 10 different ideas for blockchain startups. You come into the company and you start working on several of them. And um, if you perform well, you can maybe take a lead of a project. And then, um, yeah, then it, it just goes that you build a pitch deck. You try to pitch, try to get some money, build an MVP, and all that stuff that uh, that you have to do to to get a startup running. And we were among um, the yeah one of the best ideas in the in the very first cohort of blockchain founders group. That's why we got um, yeah funding, mm -hmm. and um, that's why we started an actual company and actually hired people and then actually built a product. So getting the first funding was pretty tough because uh, I've. Like, you know, I've watched Shark Tank in the in TV, but I've never really pitched in front of uh, real investors and business angels. Um, so they they pose very tough questions to you. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, we, we actually made it and, and got, the, got the funding back then. It was in January of, uh, of last year. Um, Amazing. Yeah. Also, uh, I really, uh, you, you said a lot of things. First of all, when you talked about this entrepreneurial flat, think a little bit about Scientology you know this movie when they had like these cans and they were measured about if they are lying or oh, not yeah, yeah. I <laughs> um, know that, yeah I know that yeah <laughs> but uh, yeah, with, with, the, with the blockchain founders group are the ideas for the businesses are they like from from the blockchain founders group or do you um, go there and have your own ideas which you want to pursue um, you can do both so you can come and bring your own idea or if you don't have an idea, you can just apply and say, hey, I just like to work on one of your ideas um, and they will they will also have use um, for you. So I can encourage everyone to to apply to Blockchain Founders Group. Um, I liked the program, the program very much. It doesn't cost anything. And if you're good, uh, if your idea is good and your team is good, you get you even get funding in the end. And um, yeah, it, it was really a nice launch for, for me, a nice kickoff to my to my startup career. 
And did you apply together with your co-founder uh, co or did you apply it alone? Uh, I actually applied alone. So I met my co-founder at Blockchain Founders Group. I got ah, okay. basically matched. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, nice. And uh, also maybe one question because I'm quite interested in their business model uh, model, and also the next um, the next podcast episode will be with Yong from the Blockchain Founders Group. Um, ah, you cool. probably yeah, know him. Yeah. Yes. And um, are they like a venture capital company? They are, right? Like the Blockchain Founders so, Group. Yeah. So first they are more like an, an incubator program, mm -hmm. um, but they do have a venture capital branch. Uh, which is uh, blockchain founders capital so it's like a separate entity but they belong together and they do also um they um, they make venture investments in their in the companies sometimes mm -hmm. um if if you convince them um but they're also very well connected to all kinds of venture funds and all kinds of business angels so they they, they have a huge network and um even if they don't fund you in the beginning maybe um they will yeah forward you to someone who will then Find you so yeah sounds sounds very interesting and when you're part of an accelerator just for me to understand more about the startup landscape do they also take a share in your startup they do right um yeah so blockchain founders group in my case they um they didn't take any money which is mm -hmm. nice because some of them some of the accelerators do um, you have to pay them up front. So that's, that's not cool. Blockchain Founders Group doesn't take your money, but of course uh, they uh, take some of your shares in the end, right? But this is actually best practice. So Y Combinator uh, does the sure. same, I think. And um, it's also, in my eyes, the better way because by taking your equity and not your money, they actually prove to you that they believe in your idea, right? Yeah. Because uh, if they just take your money, like, then I'm always skeptical. I was like, okay, if you believe in my startup, then why don't you want to, want to be a part of it, right? <laughs> yeah, true. And now I tease at your startup uh, quite a lot, but uh, can you maybe tell me what you are um, doing? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, so the idea for Basenote was to make it easier to um, to use crypto payments, yeah? especially for small companies like Web3 uh, companies, but also for freelancers. Um, in our research, we discovered that a lot of freelancers um, are located in emerging markets, yeah, especially Africa, um, Southeast Asia, um, and, and South America, for example. And they are often located in countries which have um, not a good banking system and which are underbanked. Mm -hmm. And then we were thinking, okay, blockchain and especially stable coins, right? Stable coins uh, that represent, for example, the US dollar, they represent a huge a huge leap forward, a huge uh, improvement over um, regular traditional bank payments. And we were like, okay, how can we make this more usable for, for people um, in these countries? That's why we did, uh, developed Basenote, where you can, on one hand, do accounting. If you, are, if you are a Web3 company, you can do all the accounting, integrate your crypto assets to your QuickBooks and so on. But more importantly, you can send out crypto invoices and pay people in crypto. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, when you want to get paid in, it, let's say, US dollar tether, which is like uh, the most used stable coin uh, on Ethereum, then you have to tell your clients, hey, I like to get paid in this coin, but uh, on this network, because US dollar tether exists on multiple networks, right? Also on Polygon and on Binance chain and so on. So you have to use the correct network, the correct token. And of course, if you are, let's say, writing your invoice in your local currency, then you have to make the conversion. And we do all of this in our app and make it super easy to get paid in crypto, in, in tokens and in stable coins. This is, this is basically our main uh, feature. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, I really like it because I think it's, it has utility. And I have also to say I'm, I'm quite crit critical about a lot of Web3 projects. But mm -hmm. after the Crypto Assets Conference, and I also did a podcast episode um, I also talked about your, your startup uh, just for a short period of time. And I think oh, cool. um, this gives like, yeah, it's, it's, it has like a utility. And also looking at countries, for example, Turkey or um, also probably right now the European Union with the high inflation. But of course, there are even more extreme countries where the currency also um, loses a lot of value. 
Um, I think this is quite an interesting idea because right now, if you could choose in which currency you would like to be paid, I, for example, I probably would use um, US dollar because mm -hmm. they have like, uh, they raised their interest rate. And I think the European... but you don't believe in the euro. You don't believe in the future of the euro. <laughs> I, I believe Just... in the future of the euro, but I think it's hard yeah. for the European Union because if you would now increase the interest rate to a certain point, probably countries like um, Italy or Greece would have um, a lot of trouble. So, yeah. To be honest, I'm uh, a huge fan of um, this whole macro world and like looking at the broader picture and all that stuff. And I'm surprised. So I think in the eurozone, we all we are like somewhere around two or three percent interest, right? Compared to US, which has like four four percent uh, interest rate. Um, I'm surprised that nothing major broke yet in the in the European Union because uh, yeah, we 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 are at zero percent for such a long time. Um, I'm I'm excited to see what this next year will bring now because uh, yeah. I'm I'm like wondering how high will they have to raise the rates to like really contain inflation and also how high can they raise the rates uh, before yeah some European country gets into real trouble right uh, yeah true yeah. and uh, the problem I think is also with the wealth erosion um, so in in our generation to earn more money than our fathers for example or the parent generation did and for example maybe not speaking about um, every country, but let's take the the U.S. as an example, but also Germany, with mm -hmm. the cost of living, it's it's insane. So I come from like a, a middle class family, but it was able for a certain amount of time um, that my father could sustain a whole family, and only he worked. And even though in Germany yeah. it's also a luxury, so um, also we probably. Um, higher middle class of course middle class is also a question of definition as some germans know some people are millionaires and they uh, say they are middle class um mm. but you know uh, right now i live in munich uh, with the the renting prices and also looking at for example healthy food vegetables and stuff uh, i think this is a, a problem of our generation yeah sure and um so healthy food and all that is is important uh, but what's like let's say you want to buy a house right yeah. in the future let's say you want to get some like some real estate exposure that's almost impossible now if you like you can inherit it yeah but if you just work and i mean if you have like a scalable business model okay maybe then then it's possible if you, but if you just work you know like from 9 to 5 like a regular job um, you get a decent um, salary, but um, I think if you if you earn more than three thousand euros a month, don't quote me on that. But I think then you're already in like the top ten percent earners here in Germany. Like, uh, I mean, of course, uh, after taxes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and even if you are like in the top uh, top ten percent earners, like with three thousand euros a month, it's it's like super hard to like let's pay your rent. Uh, like sustain uh, your 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 life maybe you even have a kid and then save enough money for for a house which costs i don't know in munich probably half a million euros or more, yeah, more so yeah. yeah or more and like you can save basically until you're 60 years old <laughs> so uh, this is something that probably our parent generation didn't face in in that degree i would say mm -hmm. Totally. And also I, I listened to some um, a YouTube video from, from Peter Thiel and he also talked about the, the pace of innovation and that uh, it is proclaimed that we are in innovating a lot, but actually innovation is quite slowing down in the last years. And I also don't know how the future will look like, but I also have to say I did an episode um, my last epi podcast episode was 11 things I'm critical about Web3. And mm -hmm. I'm critical about that a lot of people in, in the crypto space have quite a negative attitude towards the state. And of course, also with the network state and these concepts, I think they are very interesting and also with Bitcoin. But as like a European or a German citizen, I still think it's my responsibility to try to fix like the inherent issue because I don't know uh, I think Bitcoin for example 
I, I'm not sure if if Bitcoin could um, help like the whole population to have a, a good living standard. I think it mm -hmm. played very well for a lot of early adopters and they took their fair share of profits. And probably even if you, and there's no financial advice, but if you're currently in the Web3 space, you're probably still early, but I'm not sure um, how this will um, turn out in the future. Yeah, yeah, interesting. So um, maybe I can ask you also something. Uh, what do you like? What do you think is the problem that Bitcoin solves? Like the biggest problem that Bitcoin solves? I thought a lot about this, and yeah. what what I like is that's like a decentralized system, and you cannot change it. And for example, if we would have like a And it's very hard because in today's age, a lot of uh, a lot of things are changing so fast that you also need the agil uh, the ag agility to adjust. Um, but with Bitcoin, for example, it's like a stable system, and of course, they also have the updates. And now also, you have to be. Uh, I think it's also you have to be critical about the narrative because I think the mm -hmm. question: What will be happen if the 21 million bitcoins are mined? People say there will ever forever be only 21 million bitcoins, but I think, and I, I'm now going maybe a little bit around your question, but I will answer it also. I think after the yeah. 21 million bitcoins, and I talk, for example, to the project lead of Peercoin about this, and I, I said, or we discussed that then the network would have quite high transaction costs so that it would be profitable for the miners. So because the miners would take their share from the transactions and this would automatically make the Bitcoin network not so inclusive anymore because you would have probably higher fees. And then I think mm -hmm. it would be not too unlikely that you, there would be in the future maybe also like a Bitcoin fork where the number of Bitcoins will be increased because it would be possible. There have been forks be before, before with the Bitcoin cash or Ethereum, Ethereum Classic. Yeah. But what I like, it's like a trustless system. And I think if you have like a stable system and in the European Union, they had like fixed rules also for the member states, how much debt they could take, um, how they should operate, that inflation should be around this point. And then everything changed because they made a lot of exceptions. Okay, this state could take more debt and this state could do this and that. And this, um, I think that mm. these factors... And also, um, I would say under regulation, not over regulation, but under regulation in the banking sector led to the financial crisis. And this is why I personally think Bitcoin and also distributed ledger systems are quite an interesting concept to solve some of these inherent um, problems. But there are also some things I, I think even now After hours of research, I have not fully understood. And it's the same probably with the monetary system because there are a lot of economists and nearly nobody saw the uh, 2008 financial crisis come. And nobody saw that um, interest will be uh, negative and all the stuff. And I think with, with Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies, I'm not so sure if the situation will be completely different. What's your opinion on mm -hmm. this? Yeah, that's that's quite interesting. I, I like listen to you. So you you touched on a on a lot of um, on a lot of subjects, and I think so to understand what problem Bitcoin actually solves, you need to understand what money is, right? And um, you all already put a few hours of research in there, um, and um, so in my opinion, money is a tool that we that we use to allocate resources, right? So. Somehow we live in a world where everything is scarce, right? Uh, all the resources around us are somehow limited. There's a limited number of cars and apartments and everything that we want to consume mm -hmm. or use. And we need a tool that reflects this scarcity um, that we can use to trade, right? So money is like one side of every transaction. And it's like just something that we use, which should be also scarce uh, to reflect our scarce environment in a, in a proper way, in my opinion, right? So this is just what I'm thinking. And if money isn't scarce, then it leads to misallocation of resources because, because it basically signals to all the market participants that, hey, 
we have so many resources we have so much money um you can just allocate it wherever you want and um, this leads to distortions in the market and this basically leads also to misallocation of resources which then lowers um, the standard of living for for all of us because people who mismanage resources who don't use them for the best of their of their of the people around them that they trade with um, are given a lot of resources and in my opinion a scarce money fixes this so a money with a limited supply doesn't need to be bitcoin bitcoin is a very nice solution for that um, before that we had gold uh, which is also um, a scarce money that is uh, that you cannot just uh, yeah create by pushing a button um, and a lot of people even people that work in the banking space for for many years um, were shocked when they when they talk to me about money and about interest rates and all that stuff and i tell them hey you know that when you take a loan from your bank that the money is just created out of nothing and i was talking to one of my um one of my friends who is a little bit older than me and he's working in the banking uh, sector for more than 20 years and i told him this and i was like yeah that's how it works if you like you want to buy a house you take a loan a credit from your bank the bank creates the money for you and he was like no this can't be true this is impossible like uh, my sparkasse or whatever my bank is cannot just create money like just like that it's money from other people i'm like no look it up it's called uh, fractional reserve banking yeah or in, in german uh Giralgeldschöpfung. and it's like it's been like that for for many decades and it's, uh, it's best practice and he was so shocked <laughs> i think he uh i don't know what, what he did after that but it, it could, i could see it in his in his face that he was so shocked about it and it is shocking that some people work for money and other people push a button and create money um and in my eyes this is the the root of a lot of problems that we have um and this is one of the fundamental problems that bitcoin solves in my opinion so from a society perspective those who profit from the system are those who take debt and use it for example to buy real estate and i think a lot of this accumulates to the top of um like the top one percent or like mm -hmm. people who are very entrepreneurial and use debt for example for their businesses because a lot of people cannot do it because you have to work a lot of time to have your let's say 25 percent um, down payment to take up debt and then you take a long time to scale and at the top there are people with billions of dollars who can do it like exponentially and i think this is also mm -hmm. a problem because when we look at the money which is printed you look at how it uh, infected the assets i think um, the majority of the people is losing while some people are profiting or maybe not losing in the in the same same amount so it comes to like also our how do you say it, split in, in in groups this also what i think is is quite mm -hmm. critical and there are of course theories uh, i read a lot of economic theories also where some people i, I don't know if it's nesim talib but some economists said it's like the natural thing in human history is that um, wealth accumulated over time to a certain uh, amount of people. So, For example, if you have like the Roman Empire or any empire, there was like a very wealthy, very wealthy people at the top and a lot of people um, down there. And like the middle class was something which was not really existing. But after, for example, World War II, a lot of things were destroyed and things had to be rebuilt. And for example, people at the top, a lot of them lost their fortune and a lot of people started from zero, which enabled the middle class. And what we're seeing right now is, I would say, the extinction of the middle class because those are the people also who cannot, who are not able to avoid taxes legally or illegally or whatever i mean a lot of these systems they are not even illegal they might be unethical but not illegal um, with all these tax heavens but who is paying the taxes and it's in most cases it's not the people at, at the top and also not the 
uh, global companies at the top who also, I think Scott Galloway published a book where he said, uh, I think the, the from the biggest um, US companies, now there's um, the line is crossed where f more than 50% of them have profits and tax havens. Uh, havens. Mm. So, um, yeah. yeah, this is not a good development in my opinion. Yeah, I, I would agree with you there. And um, to stay with the, so I, I, I really like this analogy from Cypher Dana Moose. He said that taking credit from your bank is basically mining fiat money because you're creating new units of it together with your bank, of course, right? The bank takes a cut and you, you get fresh money, freshly printed money. And let's say I want to get a credit from my bank. I'm not very rich, right? Um, and I go to the bank, I don't own any real estate and the bank will probably give me no money or if they give me a credit they will probably be like yeah but you pay 10 percent interest or something because you are high risk uh, of, of defaulting but let's say i already have some real estate if i own 10 um yeah 10 houses in, in germany or in some city and i go to the bank and i post them as a collateral and I say hey give me a credit for my 11th house <laughs> then the bank will give me a credit for maybe one percent or two percent uh, interest rate and this can be considered like the mining difficulty. So it's like people who already have a lot of assets, for them, it's cheaper to create new money. And people who don't have a lot of assets, who start over fresh, they, for, for them, it's harder to create new money, to mine new euros and dollars. So this is really unfair in my eyes. And it's, it's like people who already own a lot of assets make the rules for everyone. And this is something in my eyes also that can be fixed by by Bitcoin and by the blockchain technology, um, because no matter no matter how many Bitcoins you have, you're not changing the rules of the network. It doesn't matter. Right. It, uh, so because they separated that from the um, yeah from the ones who hold the coins and from the ones who who create the rules of the network. And this is something that is maybe missing in our in our system, too. But still, um, you could argue that those who have a lot of assets could buy with this money mining power and yeah. then in in the end also change the rules to to their benefit. They could try. Yeah, they could try. But it's not that easy. So you can try to buy up all the miners, but someone has to sell it to them, to, to you, right? So or you have to build them, but that's that takes a lot of time. And uh, the, the marginal cost is, is pretty high of, of buying all the miners or at least more than half of it, because that's what you will need. Um, and even if you have, if you, even if you manage to buy that amount of, of, of miners and you get a lot of hash rate, then you compete against uh, all the people in the world who are also mining. And even if you manage to, to attack the network this way, uh, which has so far not happened, then this position of power is not permanent because better mining machines will be built and you need to buy them too. You need to upgrade your equipment constantly. You need to find cheap sources of energy constantly and you need to keep up to date and actually interact with the, with the real world in order to stay the top miner with the most hash power. If you are in a proof of stake system, then this is not the case. And if you are in the fiat system, this is certainly not the case because once you are um, yeah, the one who makes the rules for the money, then yeah, who, who will stop you, right? It's, it's not yeah. possible. I'm thinking also about like an interview I did with the CEO of financial.com. He's called Dr. Eisenhofer and he's also, um, he has an extensive capital and monetary economist knowledge. And he, he said, okay, we have the US as like a country with uh, Canada and Mexico, two very friendly neighbors, but they still have like the biggest military in the world. Of course, mm. they, they also want to have a strong currency. And um, these days I'm, I'm reflecting a lot of, of this because I'm, I'm a fan of, let's say, Western values, not, not everything. Yeah. But I think I'm, I'm not like, I, I quite like um, the US or like what the US gave to us in, in a lot of ways, of course, not always. But I don't know mm -hmm. what would happen if the US dollar would lose uh, its significance also from like a geopolitical perspective. 
I heard also yeah. Charlie Munger talking about this. I just don't know it. I can't. Or I cannot also answer it. But there's uh, there's a correlation um, when you see like the the most influential um, countries and the um, their currency as a reserve currency. There's a nice chart. Was always like when uh, the most countries use, for example, the Great British Pound as a reserve currency. It was like the the peak, or probably at this range, it was the peak of influence of the British Empire. And I think also I I, I will have to look up this chart. Don't want to say anything wrong, but mm -hmm. I think uh, right now you also see like a declining influence of the U.S. dollar. And I don't know what uh, this would mean for the future. And yeah, but but still, I uh, also quite interested in crypto. I also thought about what would happen, for example, if like a state like China or the US would want to attack Bitcoin. Uh, of course, in, right now, I think Bitcoin is not a currency. I think it's a digital store of value. I, I see it as some form of digital gold. Mm -hmm. But what would happen if a country would use just a fraction in, in the US it has just to be a fractional amount of their sp military spending to buy like mining equipment or buy servers from from other existing companies to for example attack the Bitcoin network and I, I, I have no answer to that that's interesting and I, I liked what you said in the beginning that they have the biggest military they're basically everywhere in the world right with the, with the army but um, do you think this military is necessary to or is it correlated to the power of the dollar? You you need uh, like are you saying that you need this kind of military equipment to protect um, to protect the dollar too? I think so. I I, I yeah, think probably, right? it's it's yeah. not only the military, but I think it's the overall influence. So yeah. you will need to have a strong military. You have a, the strongest economy in the world, and then your currency is the strongest or the most used reserve currency. And then you could also use your currency in in a way that you like it, and right. I, right. because everyone is holding it basically, right? And and it's it's like if you want to trade oil, um, it's almost impossible to do it without using the dollar. It's it's crazy, and there's there's huge demand for dollars. I, I was just thinking, you know, in our in in our app base note, we have statistics about what currencies are mostly used for the crypto invoices, and it's almost. It's like ninety percent stablecoin dollars, right? Not not euro stablecoins, not Chinese one or whatever. I don't know if they have a stablecoin even, but it's dollar stablecoins. And if you ask anyone in the world, be it in Turkey, in in the Philippines, or I don't know in Peru, uh, like what would, how would you would like to get paid for your work? Most of the people, or almost everyone, will say, um, yeah, give me US dollars, right? Yeah, uh, because uh, all the other currencies are on the long term, on the long term picture, they are weaker. They will lose value against the dollar, um, and people know that. Um, even though, even when they like not read about the monetary system and all that stuff, they they know instinctively that the dollar is the king of fiat, and it's like the the smallest pain to, to hold the dollars compared to the others. I mean, it inflates with ten percent a year in a, a loss in purchasing power, which is still a lot, right? But it's still better than the Turkish lira or yeah all the other currencies. So I would also use the U.S. dollar because if you look at the monetary system, and even if you say okay, uh, there's no gold standard uh, standard anymore, what's backing mm. the currency? And I think um, I also a little bit skeptical to say it's it's um, based or printed out of thin air, even though it is in in some way, but they are still the US economy backing their currency. Yes, and yes. if I would bet on one economy, at least at the current point of time, it would be the US economy. Because Definitely, I think yeah. they attract mm. all the talent in the world and they attract the best people from all over the globe. And they have like mm. incredibly, uh, an inc incredibly um, entrepreneurial a nation and i think not everything about the us is great but at least from this perspective it is probably the still the country of entrepreneurs yeah yeah definitely i i would agree with you there but um like earlier you were saying that the us dollar might be on the decline already yeah. so what well, like the they're still number one time. but like what needs to happen for them to to actually get in trouble and for the dollar to 
become number two in the world and not number one like what, what do you can you think of any scenarios yeah, right How now this might we we had like the the war in ukraine and um with the swift you think system this is threatening the, the u.s dollar this war yeah because yeah. It, it it affects the u.s dollar because people see if they have for example uh, currencies in in other countries there there's the possibility that these assets will be frozen and right, i think right. uh, a lot of countries even if you look at the, the the war in ukraine and you look at um at statistics or which countries were very in in the beginning maybe not now but in the beginning of the war i saw some like a world map and there were like countries um um backing the war or, or countries having no opinion about this and mm -hmm. um not taking a state uh, a stand about this and it was quite crazy how the world was split you have these classical the western bloc with us canada the european union and japan south korea um, and then also um australia and uh, yeah. new zealand and then you have also a lot of african countries countries from south america from asia uh, where it was not like you have russia against the world was more like russia versus the western bloc even though the media portrayed quite a different picture I also have to say from my personal opinion i always try not to be political but when it comes down to the conflict in ukraine i um, totally stand behind the ukraine so this is what i say so mm -hmm. I, I back the ukraine in this case yeah it's it's super interesting because who would you trust to like store your value for, like um like do you trust russia to not devalue the ruble i wouldn't <laughs> right do you trust the chinese to not devalue their local currency no so the dollar is still the best option yeah yeah and i can see that what you said earlier like the us freezing assets of other countries is actually weakening the dollar maybe more than they realize because this is uh like this is a, sh a shift in in a paradigm because suddenly you realize hey this is not independent like this this money is not independent it's it's actually you need to be friendly to the us in order to them not taking your stuff and this is a signal i don't know if they if they realized how strong of a signal that that was to the rest of the world like when they seized the assets from from russia even though it was probably justified to do so but other countries see this and they realize well right now i'm like on friendly terms with the us but i could be next right so i think it was not only the... the us it was like the western block versus yeah. it is like more or less one connected system maybe one some countries mm. connected stronger together the uk with the us uh, have probably one of the closest connections maybe also with some other states like australia and they also have like their uh, how do you say it the and their national security they work very close together yeah probably, and stuff. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But, but also what i was wondering what i wanted to ask you about your software um why and, and this is quite a natural question but why do people for example prefer stable coins or well, let's say actual dollars um well they would prefer actual dollars but if you are living let's say in uh, in nigeria um then it's not that easy to get actual dollars right your only option would be cash but mm -hmm. physical dollars uh, are hard to come by and um most banks don't don't just give them away like that so you will have to first of all you need a bank account and you need to drive to your bank which is not like here in germany just like a few hundred meters but maybe you have to drive to the next city or something try to pick up the physical cash um, if if they give you even dollars they probably give you the local currency uh, which is uh, inflating away <laughs> and um, so the next best solution is virtual dollars that anyone can hold on your on, on their phone right and we have this technology um, of course there are risks um, also um, attached to that right so you have to you have some trusted party right like, like a circle or tether um, and um, of course you can like you have to secure your phone all that stuff but it's still better than uh, getting paid in in a local currency which loses value like crazy 
uh, it's still better um, than hoarding cash in your in your apartment, uh, which is risky. So holding virtual dollars on your phone is actually a real game changer, I think, for, for a lot of people. And, and here I also have to uh, dig also again a little bit deeper. When I would compare your software to, for example, Upwork. For example, I worked in the past with Upwork for freelancers mm -hmm. and there's the point I worked also pro most times with, with uh, freelancers from Germany, but also from India and I paid them. And I think I got also the invoice in dollars, but I don't know how the freelancer got paid. Do you know if it's typical for Upwork and Fiverr to pay the people in their country's currency or to pay them in dollar? Mm, yeah, and so most of these um, platforms, they make money because they control the payment process, right? Mm -hmm. So they take, I don't know, 20, maybe 25% of the of the salary of the freelancer. And that's how they, that's, that's their business model, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if the, if the currency is converted, but I would, I would suggest uh, that the, that is probably converted because we were also hiring people around the globe. Um, and when we were paying them, um, we we're using either we are paying, uh, we are paying them in stable coins using our own software, but mm -hmm. not every freelancer is like savvy with like wallets and not everyone wants stable coins. So the others we just paid with, um, with wise or, or yeah, PayPal if it's possible, but it's not in every country. Mm -hmm. um, and then usually it's converted into the local currency because um, you cannot just hold US dollars uh, in your PayPal account if your uh, residence country is India, for example, right? Ah, uh, no, um, I get it. Because I'm I'm comparing always existing solutions to um, to what Web three startups are building, for example. And if we would have, for example, a company, let's say just a fear company, or even your company, you could probably also do invoicing with, with fiat currency. And you would pay, for example, freelancers in, in India also in, in, let's say, US dollars. Then you, of course, have would have to have like a bank account or something like that. And yeah. now you do it directly over the wallet. Exactly. There's there's no um, no man in the middle anymore and no one who can hold the payment back or censor it and uh, you know there, there are crazy things happening um, some of uh, some of our freelancers um, told us that whenever they get more than a thousand dollars from a foreign source the bank will just freeze their account and send them a survey and they have to answer like this survey like where's the money from what are you doing with it blah 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 all this even though it's their money they worked for it they earned it um, I mean, of course, there need to be some kind of uh, protection against money laundering, all that stuff. But withholding uh, the fruits of uh, of their labor from from honest workers is, uh, in my eyes, um, not not the solution. And you don't have that with with the blockchain. You don't have that when you hold your own wallet and your own keys. No one can stop um, people paying you. And um, yeah, this this is also a big advantage. Yeah. It's it's very interesting. And I also uh, want to ask you. Is USDC often used, more often used in your platform yeah. or USDT? Yeah. Actually, USDC is, is like, I think, the number one currently. Um, so what we offer is, like, we are currently building this feature, but it will go live um, in, the, in this quarter of this year, um, that you can pay with euros or with dollars, and then we convert the money into US dollar coin or US dollar tether and send it directly to the wallet of the freelancer. Um, and this is, uh, will only cost a few cent and it's, yeah, it's so much better than using a wire transfer <laughs> because the fees are, are very expensive there. Yeah. It's also very, very interesting. And also thinking about other cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Ethereum, I thought what I really like about Basenote.io uh, and for example, credit cards that let you pay with crypto is that through you, and even though you might be also in an intermediary when you would pay with Bitcoin or let's take maybe not you, uh, but for example, uh, those credit card companies, which will you mm. also take their share. Um, but then you could pay with Bitcoin and Bitcoin then becomes like from a form of digital gold, really a currency in in another way. But I think what you are saying with like the um, digital like with um, USDC and USDT, um, it's it's quite interesting that these currencies are used. And also thinking about what would happen 
when we have like central bank digital currency, you would have, you could also u use it for your platform, right? Probably. Probably, yeah. Yeah, probably. I mean, if they manage to uh, release it someday, then uh, we are happy to, to integrate that too. I mean, we, we're just building what, what people demand. And um, yeah, so right now, not a lot of people want to get paid in, in Bitcoin, unless you're like a Bitcoin maxi who calculates everything in Satoshis, then yeah, you can also use uh, our product to get paid in Satoshis. But most people want dollars, right? Because everything is priced in dollars. And if there is a CBDC at some point, sure, we can like, we can of course also integrate it. Um, but I don't know. I'm like a bit skeptical of CBDCs to be honest. Uh, um, but yeah, let, let's see what the future brings. I mean, maybe in my eyes, CBDCs are a little bit kind of a solution looking for a problem. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, but um, yeah, yeah, we, we, we will see. Depends. I, I my opinion depends strongly how it will be implemented. So if it uh, if there are certain standards which are kept, I think it can be very interesting to, for example, use also DeFi protocols with CBDC. And then I I personally would rather have the European Central Bank behind my currency than Tether. Because I don't mm. uh, trust Tether. I think yeah. uh, they are very shady. Uh, I also don't trust their yeah. corporate network. And I don't also trust Terra Luna. Or, of course, Circle seems, to be fair, seems quite um, legit to me. Also no financial advice. So um, this is the stablecoin I would trust the most. But if I would um, have to place my trust in like a corporation or into at this point of of time i also have to say it's a privilege to live in the european union right so there are probably a, a dozens of countries where i would rather have like a very well managed um, very well governed private organization uh, i would trust it more than than my state but living in the european union or from the us i would probably trust the, the central bank digital currency more but the topic of privacy is a whole another one, maybe for another podcast episode. <laughs> yeah, I would love to. I mean, you, you're making a very good point. Uh, so who would you trust more? Like some entity that creates virtual dollars and uh, it's just like, okay, trust me, bro. I have enough dollars for everyone if you want to cash out. Or would you go to an entity who creates virtual dollars who actually has a money printer in the back and in case they act, they would run out of, of uh, real dollar, they, they will just print more. So, yeah, a central bank is in this case probably the better stablecoin issuer than some Tether or Circle company, right? Yeah, probably because they cannot go bankrupt. That's that's the point, right? If it if if it's well governed, I think it could be also interesting to have like a fully open source. I, I I'm not too in too involved with the Circle, so I don't know how they do it. Mm. But if they would publish all the reports and if Tether would uh, make their book open and they would say, okay, we have, I don't know, $60 billion and we have it in bonds and we have it in a very con conservative um, portfolio and maybe we hold 30% of this portfolio in cash, then I would say, okay, it might be legit, but they also would have to be like a good asset manager but they don't even um, have legit audits in my opinion. So right yeah. now, even though the um, European Central Bank could print money out of thin air, they are still the, um, the European uh, economy backing this. Right, right. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe one final question to wrap up um, is a question about the future. Where do you see Web3 in five years, so in 2028? In, okay, in five years. Um, well, so Web3, I'm not really sure if it's, you know, it's it, it, maybe it's one of those buzzwords where they're like, okay, Web2, you can like interact with content. Web3, you can own content and it's like the new paradigm. Maybe, maybe, I'm not sure. So we have these hype cycles and... Even back then, when I entered the crypto space, 2016, 2017 was crazy hype year. And back then, we already got NFTs. Yeah, back in Colored 2017, coins. we had CryptoKitties, one of ah, the yeah, first yeah. NFT projects, right? So 
and then they died and today no one talks about them anymore and uh all these all these altcoin projects and nft projects from from uh, 17 died then we had like this winter and then some new projects came back right so i'm not really sure if web3 um is like a seasonal thing right um yeah or if it's really here to stay um because this uh yeah it's, it's hard to tell actually i mean do people want to own digital assets in in a way that web web3 suggests um maybe probably but i'm not like 100 percent sure that it's the case so uh, either it's gone or it's super popular, but I think there's no no way between. So my prediction would be Web3 can be super popular and like very commonly used in the future. Um, maybe we just don't call it Web3 anymore because, I mean, I don't call Facebook Web2. I just call it Facebook, right? So we will have apps on top of it um, that will just naturally integrate the ownership of assets and of user data and all that stuff without even telling you they're using the blockchain in the, in the background, right? Yeah, that's so very that's, interesting. That's yeah. I, I, I am commenting on this. I think it will be part of the existing web. I see Web3 not as like the totally blockchain-based web, but more like the next stage of the web. And of course, it's a question of definition. I define it a little bit for my own, but I think there are good use cases where current let's say the web two will be enhanced by blockchain mm. technology, but I think it will not replace a lot of the cloud infrastructure uh, because of the blockchain trilemma and blockchain is of course not the solution for everything. But if you have, for example, the IPFS network or other uh, infrastructure services, I think there are some good use cases which will persist in the future. And maybe it will also be like a, like blockchain technology will be a quite considerable share of the web um, in the future. Yeah, yeah. Let's hope so. Let's let's uh, let's hope so. Yeah. So say, thank you very much, Oliver, for being on my show. It was a pleasure. Yeah, yeah, it was a pleasure too. Like we really like it's more than an hour already. Wow, it didn't re didn't feel like it. It felt uh, felt like talking. Uh, yeah, felt like talking in a natural conversation. So yeah. I it's enjoyed true. it a lot and maybe sometime in the future uh, I can be your guest again. Definitely. Looking forward to it. Thanks for listening to this week's podcast episode. If you liked it, I'm always happy for a positive review. And if you're watching on YouTube, you could subscribe to my YouTube channel and give me also here a thumbs up because it would really help me to grow my audience and to increase also the quality of the show. Besides that, I hope you all have a nice day. And hopefully we hear each other or you hear me on the next week's episode. So have a nice day. Cheers. <laughs>